Hello, and welcome to The Bard's Truth, episode 0.2, King's Blood 2, Eyes of Opal and Amethyst, Tourmaline and Jade. This episode is in follow-up to my prior work, King's Blood, Elitism, Magic, and 10,000 Years of Sex in Westeros, where I focused on how widespread I think King's Blood is in George R.R. R. Martin's The World of Ice and Fire and A Song of Ice and Fire. This episode, I'll focus more on why I think the texts are hinting at the interpretation I presented there. I think the best pieces of evidence we have for this are a connection between an obscure passage about the Far East in the World of Ice and Fire and a vision from Danny late in A Game of Thrones. In the aftermath of Jorah carrying Danny into Drogo's tent while Miri Mazdur was in the middle of performing blood magic to save Drogo, Danny has several dreams slash visions. The visions start with the mantra of, you don't want to wait the dragon, do you? As I discussed in my first Dragon Bonds essay, this concept is first introduced to induce fear in Danny, fear of Viserys mistreating her. However, as she self-actualizes throughout the story, she begins to adopt her own identity as a dragon to instead give herself courage. In a parallel manner, this mantra shortens through her dream to want to wake the dragon and wake the dragon which could be symbolic of Danny embracing her dragon identity or even unleashing her own anger, but it also literally suggests that she will wake her dragons from stone by hatching them. This identity as a dragon was earlier tied directly to the term King's Blood in the very first Daenerys chapter, even as Drogo is also compared to Aegon the Conqueror. In this context, she sees a vision of four ghosts slash kings who egg her on, pun intended, <laughs> to go faster toward the climax of the dream, where she flies. Here is the passage. Want to wake the dragon? Ghosts lined the hallway, dressed in the faded raiment of kings. In their hands were swords of pale fire. They had hair of silver, and hair of gold, and hair of platinum white. And their eyes were opal and amethyst, tourmaline and jade. Faster, they cried. Faster, faster, she raced her feet melting the stone wherever they touched. Faster, the ghost cried as one, and she screamed and threw herself forward. A great knife of pain ripped down her back, and she felt her skin tear open, and smelled the stench of burning blood, and saw the shadow of wings. And Daenerys Targaryen flew. Wake the dragon. From A Game of Thrones, Daenerys 9. She then, in the next two chapters, proceeds to literally wake the dragons. But I believe that at that moment, she metaphorically or spiritually further woke the magic within herself, her inheritance from her king's blood. Because of the dragon context, one of these ghosts having the same eye color as Danny, and all of them having some Valyrian features, many think that these ghosts are her ancestors, Valyrians, or those people who came before them, Proto-Valyrians. I believe that this is mostly correct. However, when George R. R. Martin published The World of Ice and Fire, we get a description of the rulers of the Great Empire of the Dawn, with matches for each of these ghost kings, plus a few spares. I believe that Danny's dream in A Game of Thrones is a direct link from the recent historical Valyrian Empire to the prehistoric but advanced ancient empire. Here is the applicable passage. In the beginning, the priestly scribes of Yin declare, all the land between the bones and the freezing desert called the Grey Waste, from the Shivering Sea to the Jade Sea, including even the great and holy Isle of Lang, formed a single realm ruled by the god on earth, the only begotten son of the Lion of Night and the Maiden Maid of Light, who traveled about his domains in a palanquin carved from a single pearl and carried by a hundred queens, his wives. For ten thousand years the great empire of the dawn flourished in peace and plenty under the god on earth, until at last he ascended to the stars to join his forebears. Dominion over mankind then passed to his eldest son, who was known as the Pearl Emperor and ruled for a thousand years. The Jade Emperor, the Tourmaline Emperor, the Onyx Emperor, the Topaz Emperor, and the Opal Emperor followed in turn, each reigning for centuries. Yet every reign was shorter and more troubled than the one preceding it. For wild men and baleful beasts pressed at the borders of the Great Empire. Lesser kings grew prideful and rebellious and the common people gave themselves over to avarice, envy, lust, murder, incest, gluttony, and sloth. When the daughter of the Opal Emperor succeeded him as the Amethyst Empress, her envious younger brother cast her down and slew her, 
proclaiming himself the Bloodstone Emperor and beginning a reign of terror. He practiced dark arts, torture, necromancy, enslaved his people, took a tiger woman for his bride, feasted on human flesh, and cast down the true gods to worship a black stone that had fallen from the sky. Many scholars count the Bloodstone Emperor as the first high priest of the sinister Church of Starry Wisdom, which persists to this day in many port cities throughout the known world. The World of Ice and Fire, The Bones and Beyond, Yeti. Some speculate that the link I make between these two passages is somehow not the correct conclusion to make, citing the missing Pearl, Amber, and Onyx Emperors in the A Game of Thrones passage. I disagree. To address the missing emperors, one only needs to consider that George hadn't conceived of the Great Empire of the Dawn when writing A Game of Thrones. If the publishing order were reversed, that criticism might be apt. George R.R. R. Martin himself learned about the history organically while writing the first few books and Duncan Egg novellas, only later deciding to give these mysterious ancestors of Danny a more full backstory in the world of Ice and Fire once he fully understood who they really were. Tales grow in the telling so he decided it necessary to add a few colors to his rainbow of magical forebears along the way. Under that light, the more important thing to consider is the ones that do match, not the ones missing in the earlier work. All four from the earlier work match a gemstone emperor or empress from the great empire of the dawn. King's Blood and Magical Inheritance from the Great Empire of the Dawn. So, what is the significance of the first four from Danny's Dream? I see a relatively basic implication for them. They are meant to imply a common ancestry and magical genetic inheritance in our four major houses in the story as of A Game of Thrones. The Starks, gray eyes corresponding to the Opal Emperor. The Baratheons, blue eyes corresponding to the Tourmaline Emperor the Lannisters, green eyes, corresponding to the Jade Emperor, and the Targaryens, purple-slash-violet eyes, corresponding to the Amethyst Empress. Certainly, we are also meant at the time to recognize that the First Men House, House Dane, also share the Amethyst eyes, even as other houses may fit the pattern as well. While the Tourmaline connection is debatable, given the wide range of colors that Tourmaline can display, I don't think that there is any other strong explanation for the passage in considering a Game of Thrones alone. Likely, by the time he went to flesh out this backstory, George R.R. R. Martin decided that with the larger world he had created, he wanted to extend that magical inheritance to more families and cultures, so he invented the rest of the emperors. I can't claim to fully know why he chose the order that he did. However, there may be some import at the tail end of the succession. I noticed that both the Bloodstone Emperor and the Amethyst Empress were direct descendants of the Opal Emperor, and I think that that might mean that the start of the line of Starks and the line of Valyrians slash Danes were very closely related, not long before or possibly coinciding with the Long Night. Now I'll make some irresponsible speculation on who was begotten on some of the science of the Great Empire. Doubtless, around that time in history, there was a lot of migration. Also, Given that the Great Empire spanned the Jade Sea, we can conclude that it was a seafaring nation. One of their early settlements may have been at Old Town, a city whose founding predates history. So, that migration likely spanned the entire known world. I mentioned in the prior essay that I believe that the magical bloodlines spread into many of the cultures across Essos and Westeros. Eye color patterns in Essos suggest that there are descendants of the Topaz Emperor in Noth and Gis the Onyx Emperor in the Dothraki Sea and along the Rhoyne, the Tourmaline Emperor in Carth and the Free Cities, and the Amethyst Empress in Valyria and its daughter cities. The Scions of the Great Empire of the Dawn in Westeros. If we take my earlier assertion about the descendants of the Tourmaline, Opal, and Jade Emperors to be among the first men, at least, that leaves only the Pearl Emperor that we haven't discussed yet. He was very early in Great Empire of the Dawn history, reigning for a thousand years directly after the God on Earth. One might suggest that we seek some of the earliest myths to solve this mystery. 
I think the answer may lie in the Iron Islands in the tale of the Grey King, although it may also be an old town. We know very little about the color of the eyes of the high towers. We have one small piece of modern information about magical eyes in the Iron Islands, though. Gilbert Farwind, who is heavily implied to be a skin changer, has eyes described like this. His eyes, Aaron saw, were now gray, now blue, as changeable as the seas. Mad eyes, he thought. Fool's eyes. Those two colors, and the fact that they are changeable, are emblematic of pearls, which are known for iridescence. Note also that the Grey King is first mentioned earlier in the same chapter, rounding the circle of the connection. The Jade Emperor follows the Pearl Emperor. The most obvious suspect for a scion of the Jade Emperor in Westeros is Garth. He was prolific and certainly known to be one of the earliest first men in Westeros to migrate by land. Lan the Clever, who founded House Lannister, is rumored to be of the line of Garth. Green eyes dominate the current members of many houses founded by the pair. The Tourmaline Emperor, who followed the Jade Emperor, may be associated with the Baratheons, though this is more tenuous given the range of colors that Tourmaline can exhibit. The Baratheons all have deep blue eyes, but none of their forebears' eye colors are mentioned. Tourmaline certainly can be blue. Then, Elenai's status as daughter of the sea god and the goddess of the wind suggests that she was of the very highest birth, which, in the Dawn Age, suggests that she was a daughter of the great empire of the Dawn perhaps related to the Tourmaline Emperor. The timing fits, too, as the story of Elenai and Durin would need to have happened after the breaking of the Arm of Dorne, which would follow Garth's first men migration. Durin himself is likely descended from Garth. Now we turn our focus to the Opal Emperor, who was the last emperor before the blood betrayal and the ensuing Long Night. The Starks are generally reported to be of the first men, but I'd say that they were founded by a descendant of the Opal Emperor and married into the First Men. In my mind, the Starks and Danes are both connected to the story of the last hero. The Danes threw their sword Dawn, and I assume that the last hero was a Stark. For them to have migrated around the same time would make sense. Further, the stories of Stark conquest in the world of Ice and Fire suggest that they were relative latecomers to the North, possibly arriving during or not long before the time of the Long Night. Might the original Stark last hero have gotten the sword Dawn from his Dane cousin to allow him to defeat the others, only to then return the sword to Starfall once the war was over, something Ned unwittingly reenacts years later? Might John be given the sword Dawn in the Winds of Winter by Ned Dane, or perhaps take it from such in the case of Darkstar, before taking up the role of the last hero? I think the answer to both questions is yes. Magic in the eyes. To close this discussion, let's contrast the eye colors of the gemstone emperors and empress with those of their hypothesized modern descendants. Most of these early royal gemstones have a depth to them associated with multiple colors, pearlescence, or a cloudy slash molten look inside of them. While the modern eyes are either described with solid colors or extremely clear gemstones, the only hint of magic in the modern eyes is in Gilbert Farwind, as discussed before, or possibly in the mentions of eyes as pools or burning eyes, signifying a depth or liquidity to them. For example, Stannis, Cersei, or others, including the magical beasts. Recall that the early gemstone emperors were also direct descendants of the god on earth. No description is made of this deity made flesh, but I imagine his eyes not only to be molten pools, but alive with light or exuding pure white light. These magical eyes would be successively diminished as the generations proceeded and lesser kings took their turns at the helm. This explains why Stark eyes are just gray as opposed to opal, or Lannister eyes green and not jade. They are diminished from those of their forebears, just as their magic is diminished. The only exceptions to this in the text are that onyx eyes are used for Alicer, Drogo, and Alaris, or amethyst eyes used for Danny two times. In closing, Early in a Game of Thrones, King's blood is tied to the Valyrian blood of Targaryens, with hints that Drogo might somehow be equal. Then, later in that same volume, Valyrian blood is tied to other great houses through a vision of Danny's forebears. Finally, in the world of Ice and Fire, 
those same forebears are given a backstory that explains how they might have migrated all over the known world, sharing their magical genes, their king's blood, near and far. What do you all think? Let me know in the comments, and give a like and subscribe to my channel. I also have a Patreon page, and I'd love to have some more subscribers there as well. Thanks a lot. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Bard's Truth. Thanks as always to the wonderful artists who shared their work with you and me here. Thanks to LML and Preston Jacobs for helping to spark some of these ideas for me.